The design of the Kaufman Museum permanent exhibit of land and people was begun in the spring of 1984. A planning committee was formed for the purpose of identifying, prioritizing, and refining the principal themes. Membership on the committee included those with expertise in natural and cultural history, as well as the museum director, curator, and exhibit designer. The committee met every two weeks for discussion. The exhibit designer made a visual summary of each discussion and presented it to the committee at the following meeting. These conceptual plans gradually reflected a growing consensus on the important themes, arrangements, and emphases. Some themes required close proximities to each other. Others could be visually and spatially separated. The principal themes were not to be given equal amounts of floor space. The number and size of the key objects and the relative importance of each theme determined how the 6,200 square feet of new exhibit space was to be allocated. Three major motifs emerged, land, people, and encounter across cultures. Under the canopy of these three motifs, seven themes were defined. Immigrant people, original people, prairie, living off the land, home and family, Mennonite life, and encounter. In addition, there needed to be an area devoted to the history of the museum and the man, Charles Kaufman and an area for rotating special exhibits so that a degree of newness would always be present. The merits of different traffic patterns were weighed. Was the exhibitry to be linear and sequential like a book? Or should it offer multiple options like an urban transit system? How do people behave in museums? The planning committee chose to organize the exhibits in a non-linear manner. Context was discussed. Decisions needed to be made between full, limited, and no context exhibitry. Full context was possible only on a very limited basis. The log cabin and parts of the home and family and making and maintaining themes approach full context. That is, an environment for objects that is believable and much like the inv original environment out of which the objects might have come. This is the familiar approach of larger, high-budget museums. Many of our exhibits fall into the pattern of limited context. Objects are supported by structures or graphics that suggest their original environments without imitating them. The prairie, living the faith, milling, and arrival exhibits are some that contain limited context elements. This approach invites considerable creativity, but requires more viewer imagination. It's an approach that is compatible with this museum's space and budget limitations. Many of the objects on exhibit are presented without context. In the absence of contextual elements, light, color, and arrangement bring these objects to life. While processing thematic concerns, it was also important to give attention to an evolving plan that would incorporate a revealing, concealing rhythm for the purpose of stimulating viewer curiosity, anticipation, and discovery. Sight lines and sight barriers needed to be defined. The museum goer was not to be confronted with too much at once. As one exhibit area is encountered, the viewer was to experience provocative glimpses of successive exhibits rather than total revelation.
planning committee discussions eventually resulted in a consensus that produced a floor plan and a model. The plan was an organic plan. It was a form that grew out of numerous discussions by many participants. It belonged to many persons. It was not superimposed on the collection. It grew out of the collection. It echoed the size and shape of the principal objects in the exhibits. Plan details were drawn to scale. Shop drawings were developed. Several areas of particular complexity required three-dimensional models. At this point, construction was begun. The first step in the construction process was to mark the floor with the exact dimensions of the display structures. This provided one final check on the layout and the spaces that existed between the components. A variety of construction techniques and materials were used. The dominant material was high density par particle board. Conventional sheetrock construction techniques were also used in some areas. The curved walls of the prairie exhibit could best be constructed with thin overlapping layers of sheetrock. After each exhibit area was completed, the case structures were prime coated and then protected from the dust generated by further construction. Special attention was required for areas that were to be closer to full context exhibits. Weathered barn boards were incorporated for the walls of the making maintaining exhibit. The porch of the Victorian house required siding and turned posts and rails. The interior of the house required a wood floor. Simulated ground was created for areas adjacent to the log cabin. All through the planning and construction process, there was a research dimension that took a variety of directions. It included workshops, visits to dozens of other museums by most of the staff members, reading the literature in the field, and bringing in professional consultants as well as a variety of local and area experts. Occasionally, it simply required another look at a nearby environment that corresponded to a particular exhibit that was under construction. Several visits to the Oxford Mill, for example, gave us the needed reference points for completing the threshing milling exhibit. The development of vocabularies made complexity more manageable, rational, and economical. Rather than infinite choice, clearly established limits were set. There was a vocabulary of measurements. Where possible, case dimensions were reduced to 30 or 60 inches. These were efficient dimensions for particle board sheets with 60-inch widths. They were also efficient dimensions for standard 24-inch or 48-inch lighting units that illuminate almost all the cases. Case walls are 3 inches thick. Most dimensions used for construction and placement of typographic elements were divisible by 3. There was a label vocabulary. Labels fell into one of four categories from level one, the seven theme banners, to level four, the object labels. Type was also reduced to a clear vocabulary. Only two type families have been used indoors, outdoors, and in printing. The vocabulary of color began with three core colors tied to the three principal motifs in the exhibit. They were rarely used in their full intensity, but each core color was reduced in value and intensity, and a set of color charts became the reference point for paint choices. Painting and graphics followed construction. 
various themes were augmented and enhanced by large-scale photos, illustrations, or diagrams. Many of the illustrations and diagrams were painted directly onto the case and wall surfaces. Finally, after construction, after painting, after graphics, came the slow process of object installation. Custom mounts had to be designed for hundreds of objects. Many of these were formed from acrylic material. Most of this work is hidden to the viewer because the goal was to enhance the object without calling attention to the manner in which it is displayed. After case arrangements were determined, the objects were removed for final inspection and cleaning and then returned. Object labels were then positioned and the case glass was installed. Design is a process. The process includes a dialogue with the gradually emerging forms. One begins with a plan, but as it takes shape, it declares a life of its own. Form, color, and objects on paper only hint at form and objects at full scale. There were constant discoveries and consequences difficult to anticipate. Most were welcomed. A few were problematic, requiring changes or abandonment. The design process is also a dialogue with each other. Designer and builders, builders and conservator, curator and designer, director and builders, the combinations were infinite. Most dialogues inevitably reflected the classic tension between concern for aesthetics and concern for content. Finding the point at which neither concern is unduly compromised is another way to define an exhibit designer's task. The entire permanent exhibit project was a remarkable team effort requiring daily interaction and consultation. The constant exchange of ideas has resulted in an exhibit in which all of the participants have a strong sense of ownership. Each team member has made an essential, irreplaceable contribution. <laughs>